Today's title, well, if you're new to the church from last year, you're going to think, this is a weird Christmas message. If you're kind of used to the fact that every year at Thanksgiving, I do a lot of philosophy and apologetics every year at Christmas, then you are going to be right at home. The Christmas story is so beautiful. It's so powerful. We've, we've got prophecy from ancient times fulfilled. We've got a, a star leading wise men. We have a virgin who miraculously gives birth to, to a child, and he's called the Savior of the world. We have a, a wicked king who wants to kill this baby, and, and, it, and there's a lot of tragedy. There's tears. There's a, a dramatic escape to, to Egypt. Instead of this king being born in a palace... He's born in a manger. Instead of it being announced in, 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 uh, in the center of, of, of New York, Times Square, the angel choirs announce it to a bunch of shepherds. This story that God says, I see the world's, I see the world's pain, I see the hardship, I see the tears, the, the weight of death hangs over everyone, I see it, and I'm going to come in person, God in flesh, to do something about it. This is such a big story. And it's so powerful and so beautiful. And imagine, if it's true, if it's true, then the greatest story ever about a relentless love, a love that will pursue people, even when they say, no, 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 I don't want you, God, get out of my life, Pursue people to the point of it looks like all hope is lost, death on the cross, and then rising up from the grave because love is stronger than death. And he says, come with me, my bride. I'll take you away. I've got something better with you. Come to me. I'll save you from all of this. It's so key and central, this message, that if it's true, it truly does change everything. You are not just a flash here today, gone tomorrow, and erased. You are an eternal being. You're made in the image of God. You were made to have a relationship with the God of the universe, the God who made a trillion galaxies, a trillion galaxies, each with an average of a trillion stars. The Bible says God knows each star by name. This God made you so that you would be in a loving relationship with him. So that's why every year at Christmas time, I want to make sure that we understand this is not just another cute story. This is not Frosty the Snowman. This is not Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <coughs> There's something big going on. And I like us to think. Now today, you're going to think, and, and maybe if you're a skeptic, you're going to say, well, that doesn't answer all the questions. Well, I know. And, and you know, we've done many more things on different days. But today, we're going to look at just one aspect we're going to look at two stories, two stories, both of them struggling for the attention of our culture today. One story says what I just said. God made you. He made you for a purpose. God loves you. And the other story says there is no purpose. There is no meaning. Well, Christmas is a holiday for people who hope. That's the, that's the title of today's sermon. Christmas is a holiday for people who hope. Please turn with me to Luke chapter 1. And we're going to look at 26 through 38. One of the familiar passages. One of the, it's a famous Christmas story. Luke chapter 1 from verse 26 to 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. So imagine, imagine that. There's no electricity. She's, she's in the night. She's, she's you know, probably laying down already, and suddenly this angel appears to her and says, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled with these words, which I think is an understatement. Um, that's an understatement. Put yourself in Mary's position. How would you have felt when suddenly this happens? Uh, and she wondered what kind of greeting this might be. It's kind of like, what the, you know. She's wondering what is going on here. 
But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, which is so funny that the angel scares her and says, come on, don't be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Mary, you found favor with God. Isn't it a beautiful thing to think that Mary was, Mary was just like you and I. She struggled. She had sins. But she had found favor with God. And, and then verse 31, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary has a very practical question. She's a pragmatist. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One will be born and be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. And this Elizabeth's son is John the Baptist, right? I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me, according to your word, the angel then left her. And I, I think verse 38 is one of the most beautiful things for a believer to ever say. God calls us to something difficult, something we don't want to do, something that's going to bring a lot of tr trouble and hardship to our life. And our response is not, God, why me? Our response is not to run away. Our response is, I'm the Lord's servant. Whatever you say, God, I'm with it. Okay, now let's turn over to another familiar passage, this time in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 from verse 18, and we'll go to the end of the chapter. Matthew chapter 1 from verse 18. Beautiful Christmas story. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So imagine Joseph, and then receiving this message from God. And Jesus, what is he born for? He's born to save people from their sins. So the first requirement to being saved is to understanding you're a sinner. Uh, uh, if you're very pleased with yourself, very pleased with your religion, you won't think you need Jesus. You won't think that you are somebody who needs to actually be saved. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The baby born in that manger was God with us. God with us, not God far away. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she had given birth to a son, and she gave him the name Jesus. So, Merry Christmas. What we've just read, if this is real, it changes everything. You can be saved from your sin. All of it. That God himself would incarnate, God would become a human being like you and I. That God would suffer on the cross, that's the real Christmas tree, not this one, but that one. Born to die to take care of our sin. My sin, I can be forgiven. And I can be with God. I can have eternal life. So, so beautiful. But contrast that with the other story. Two stories, we said, struggling for human attention. I was in an internet discussion room mostly populated by people hostile to belief in God. 
uh, recently, mainly just poking around and reading what others were thinking and feeling, trying to understand life from a different perspective. And, and people who identify, and a, a person who identified herself as an atheist asked a question about meaning and purpose in life. She was a self-identified atheist. She wanted to know from other atheists, what do you say when people ask, does life have purpose or meaning? And a few people commented that the purpose of their lives is to do whatever they want. You know, my purpose in life is to do whatever they want, which I think they know they're really not answering the heart of the question. They're kind of avoiding this idea of meaning. Uh, but the response that seemed to be most popular, at least to, in this group on that day, was don't even play that game. That's what theists do. Now, a theist is somebody who believes in, in God. She asks, does life have purpose or meaning? Don't even play that game. That's what theists do. That's what people who believe in God do. And many others chimed in with things like, like life has no meaning. Christians pretend it does, but that's because they're not realistic. So I said, Christmas is a holiday for people who have hope. And the other narrative, this meta-narrative, this, this story that ties together life at its base says, don't play that meaning game. There is no meaning. Christians are being unrealistic. Others who have rejected God have referred to human, humanity. Have you heard this before? It's, it's an idea that's kind of foreign to, to your thinking. Refer to humanity as a virus. Now, what does a virus do? It replicates itself. It grows. It spreads. And, and, and some people, who, again, who don't believe in God have said, humanity is like a virus on the planet, and we're ruining it. We're, we're destroying it for everyone else. That's at worst, or, or at best, we're described as is hairless apes or, or the religious animal, because in all of nature, we're the religious ones. So nature evolved us to be religious. We certainly aren't, according to this narrative, we certainly aren't the unique crown of creation. Made in the image of God, made by God to explore his creation through science and math and this bold, adventurous spirit, born to be loved by him, born to, to love God in return. Do you ever think about that? The way God made us. To explore all the beauty he's created, to think about it, to write songs about snow, to enjoy the crunch of snow underneath your feet, to, to use mathematics to understand black holes and the gravity and how to, to slingshot a spaceship using the gravitational pull of the, the moon. A couple years ago, I read One Atheist. Now I'm going to, I had to continually, by the way, edit athe atheist comments because they're so brutal and, and harsh. So this is an edited version. This is the family-friendly version. The human condition is a fun ride. Well, at least they got that part right. Human condition is a fun ride, but don't ever forget. So this is serious. Don't ever forget that we're all just a bunch of talking meat wrapped around a sack of warm poo programmed to eat, sleep, and procreate. Being a human, that's fun, but don't forget, you're just talking meat. You're just a sack of warm poo programmed to eat and sleep and procreate. Image of God created to understand the universe, to, created to have intimacy with the God of the universe. You're just a sack of poop. Famed atheist, this, you've probably heard of him, Bertrand Russell. He once wrote this achingly beautiful words on the massive emptiness of a universe without a creator. This is, this is poetry. It's beautiful. It moves me. It touches me to think of what the universe looks like if you don't believe that there's a God, and specifically a God that loves you. He wrote of man, humanity, that he was the product of causes his origin, the origin of man, his growth, his hopes, his fears, his loves, his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can
can preserve an individual life beyond the grave, that all the labors of the ages, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to the extinction in the vast death of the solar system, that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins, only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. Brief and powerless is man's life. On him and all his race the slow, sure doom falls pitiless and dark, blind to good and evil, reckless of destruction, omnipotent matter rolls on its relentless way for man condemned today to lose his dearest, tomorrow himself to pass through the gates of darkness, remains only to cherish, ere yet the blow falls, the lofty thoughts that ennoble his little day. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, that's the basis of this worldview, a worldview based upon hopelessness. See, when people see, say that human beings are just another animal, well, what do we do to animals? Kill them, eat them, throw them in a pile. What do we do? Humans, well, we put a monument there and we remember them. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying what that worldview is selling. Human beings are just another animal. The reason I'm not buying it, by the way, is because the people who say it are obviously not buying it. They know better. You, you euthanize a bunch of dogs at the Humane, Humane Society, that's sad. But they know it's a wicked thing to grab a bunch of human beings and euthanize them. There's a difference. They know it, but they're not saying it. I'm worried about a worldview that tells you you're just an animal and then nobody can live as if we're just animals. A worldview that we cannot live. Christianity says you're made in the image of God. That person of a different race is made of the image of God. That person who has a different education level or a different amount of money in the bank is made in the image of God. And Jesus Christ died for all of you. You're all equal at the foot of the cross. Love God and love one another. <coughs> and I'm thinking... Well, that's a worldview that I can live with. That's a worldview that I want to strive for. That's beautiful and good. People say it, but the vast majority can't live with the idea that human beings are just animals. In fact, somebody who treated humans as if they're just animals, you know what they're called? A psychopath. When love is explained as just a chemical reaction, that doesn't resonate as true with me. And guess what? Most people who say this, they don't believe it either. Love is just a chemical reaction, but searching for that one special person, searching for that relationship. Something that is more than biology. When we're told that morality is just a product of human culture, remember he said here uh, that, that the universe is blind to good and evil? What that means is this idea of good and evil, it doesn't exist apart from human culture. We create the idea of some things are right, some things are wrong. Okay, okay I'm playing devil's advocate, right? That's not what the Bible says. I'm speaking for this, this worldview. The idea of rightness and wrongness is something that's evolved in order to help our society to flourish. In that what we call moral goodness is actually a fluid concept in one generation, they say, this is wrong and right. Another generation, it changes. And if one day our world would explode, the human race would go extinct, well, then our definition of right and wrong would go extinct along with us. But again, you know what I've noticed? Even people who reject the concept of moral truth, even people who say there's really no such thing as, as uh, holiness, there's no such thing as evil, even people who reject the idea that there's right and wrong, because if there's right and wrong, if there's moral law, then there's a moral law giver, right? But even people who reject this idea of, of, of ultimate morality, 
They're quick to jump up and down and protest if they think they're being treated unfairly. Because apparently they do believe that I like mustard on my hamburger is different than saying, you cannot steal, that's wrong. I like pepperoni pizza, and I like people who tell the truth. It's just my preference. No, you know in your heart it's not. You know in your heart that one has to do with nothing at all. It's just what your taste buds say. And the other one gets to, to something deep. There is rightness, there's wrongness, there's fairness, there's unfairness, there's justice, and we yearn for justice, and, and we see mercy, and we see it as a, a moral, morally beautiful thing. Christians believe that goodness would exist even if the human race did not. That goodness is not something that God arbitrarily thought of. Uh, today I'll say murder is wrong. Uh, today I'll say, but that goodness actually is God's character. It flows from the very heart of God. He's just not making it up. Again, it seems that this worldview <coughs> that says there's no such thing as morality, you've got to deny it in order to go about with your daily life. What's the use of a, moral, uh, a world view that you cannot live, that in fact you have to deny in order to get along with people? And you know, it just doesn't feel true, does it? No such thing as goodness. It's interesting that a lot of the very people that, that argue that there's no such thing as moral truth turn around and say, but I'm a moral person. I'm a good person. And oftentimes they are. And I always say I would rather live next door to a good atheist than a selfish, self-righteous Christian. Uh, but that's besides the point. You're good. You want to be a good person because you know that that's morally better than being a nasty, selfish person. See, the reason you want to be identified as being a good person is you know in your heart that there is such a thing is right and wrong. And moral truth teaches me that I'm messed up. I want to see how evolution explains that. If I was just a, a meat computer, I think that if I did something wrong, I could program myself differently and I wouldn't make the same mistake again. You know, you go near the you go near the stream and a crocodile lunges at you, you go to a different part of the stream next time. And yet human beings, husbands, wives, we have the same fight again and again and again. We struggle with the same temptations again and again and again. There's something difficult about being human. I am messed up. The human race is broken. The Bible says that we've fallen. We've fallen from what God created us to be. And you know what's really strange? You know what's really strange? Atheists often also talk about how the world's broken, how messed up people are. Well, isn't that interesting? I want to ask them, in fact, I do ask them sometimes, how about cows? Are cows messed up? <gasps> Those immoral cows. Look at what they're doing to our environment when they overgraze. That cow just ate the last plant of that kind. How about ants? They go to war. That is so messed up. The, the tragedy of warfare. I hate war. I hate countries going to, to battle over oil or water and, and taking out, I'm going to take your kid and I'm going to take your husband and I'm going to take your friend and, and throw them at each other and see who comes out alive. I think it's very brave and noble when you fight to defend somebody's rights and to fight to save somebody from tyranny. But I hate war. And I think uh, everybody knows that there's a difference between a battlefield littered with the corpses of people who had dreams and loves and hopes and a battlefield where you see a bunch of ant bodies laying around. Everybody knows there's a difference. And yet one worldview tries to say there is no difference. Come on! It's silly. The human race is messed up. I'm messed up. And everybody knows it. For myself, a worldview without God 
just simply lacks explanatory power. This worldview I've been describing, it doesn't explain life. It, it's theolo it's, theolo it's uh, theoretical. Yeah, there's no such thing as morality. Uh, yeah, we're just, uh, we're just uh, animals. It, it, you, you know, you could tell yourself this story, but it just doesn't resemble the world we live in, does it? It doesn't look like where daily life takes place. We're told that a desire like wanting to be loved, wanting to live forever. You ever, you ever wonder about that? An antelope who's running away from a tiger or a lion or something, it's thinking, oh, the tragedy, the, the, how unfair life has been to me. Wanting justice, wanting to be forgiven. I need to be forgiven. Can somebody release this, this burden from me? Because if I'm honest, I'm not happy with myself, the way I've treated people in the past, the things that I've done. Is there forgiveness out there? No, forgiveness is an illusion. It's just a psychological, it's so sociological. Just, just learn to deal with it, cope. What do you need to be forgiven for? There's no such thing as right or wrong. I need to be forgiven. Do away with that thought. This is a worldview that you can't live. I need to be forgiven. I'm messed up, and I can't pretend that I'm not. Yearning for goodness. <coughs> I want to believe that there's something out there better than Dan Wolf. I want to believe that there's a goodness out there, that there's a truth out there, that there's a holiness out there. Learning for, yearning for moral beauty and, and truth that surpasses my own. All these things, according to this other worldview, are the result of blind evolution. Really? And if we had evolved differently, you wouldn't have those feelings. You wouldn't want to be forgiven if you just evolved differently. All of these thoughts, this desire to live forever, this desire to know truth and goodness, it's all ultimately meaningless. In other words, to cling to this worldview, you need to deny everything about yourself that separates you from the animal kingdom and makes you uniquely human. What the heck kind of worldview is that? If I was sitting in hell and I was trying to destroy this pinnacle of creation, this this creation that God loves, that God made in his image, I tell them, you're just a bunch of animals. There's no such thing as right or wrong. There's no God who loves you. Your life is going to snap and it's gone like that. Christmas, on the one hand, and then, on the other hand, an unlivable, hopeless worldview that denies almost everything about us and tells us that we're not made by God. Do you know your DNA is 98% the same as a chimp? 98%. Boy, that 2% makes a big difference, doesn't it? That's a big difference. We may be made out of the same raw material as everything else, but we, I want you to think about this. Human, human beings, we compose symphonies. We write poetry. Our hearts are stirred when we see the first snowfall of the year. We create stunning works of art. We dream dreams. We have walked on the moon. We peer into the farthest reaches of the universe. And if a successful organism is simply defined as being able to survive and pass on your genes, it seems a little bit like overkill to me. Doesn't it? The influential paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould I think he's the fellow who said life is red in tooth and claw. <clears throat> he wrote uh, something as eloquent as Bertrand Russell, very powerful. He said, we are here. Why are we here? Why, why am I here? What's the purpose of my life? Here's his answer. We are here because one odd group of fishes had a peculiar fin anatomy that would transform into legs for terrestrial creatures because comets struck the earth and wiped out dinosaurs. They're giving mammals a chance not otherwise available, so thank your lucky stars in a literal sense, because the earth never froze entirely during an ice age because a small and tenuous species arising in Africa a quarter million years ago has managed to, so far to survive by hook and by crick. We may yearn for a higher answer but none exists. 
well, I'm not so interested in the science that went before that. I'm interested in the philosophy that he ended it with. We may yearn for a higher answer, but none exists. And my question is, why do we yearn for these existential answers if none exists? Why do we yearn? What a cruel and bizarre joke evolution has played on us. We want there to be life. We, we want there to be some justice. There has to be justice. Who can forgive me? We want to connect to something beautiful and holy and good. We want our lives to have meaning. And by the way, all those desires you have, I don't know how, but evolution just made those, and there's really not an answer for them. What a cruel and bizarre joke evolution has played on us. Random chance happened to form us to the point where we actually hope we're not here by random chance. Where we desire to live lives that actually have meaning. Where we want to be loved. We, to love other people. To, I want to be a better person than I am. Than we are. We want to live forever. We don't want to believe that we're just snuffed out here. And evolution has no answer for this. You know, C.S. Lewis once pointed out that everything in your life, you have a desire, there's something to fill it. You have a desire for sex, we have males and females. You have a desire for food, there is such a thing. You get tired, there's a bed. You need shelter, we have that. Everything in life, there's a desire and there's something to fill, fill it. Until we come to these things that make us human, that separate us from. And I have desire for life to make sense. I have desire for for somebody to forgive me, somebody to accept me as I am, somebody to say it's going to be okay. I have a desire to know that this life isn't just the end. I have a desire to be part of something bigger than myself. Honeys, let's, let's keep it quiet. And then, we, and then we're told that, yeah, those desires, there's really nothing there. There's nothing for that. So strange, so bizarre. All of this is the curse of our evolutionary heritage, so we yearn for things that don't exist. That we intuitively hope for these things, and that we have to remind ourselves again and again and again, no, 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 you're just a hairless ape. No, 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 these things don't actually exist. That all of the things we hope for are just illusions. Chris Christmas stands boldly astride history, the birth of Christ tells us that we matter, that we were made to be loved, that God sees our brokenness and God cares. Christmas tells us that there's hope for the hopeful. There's hope for the hopeful. There is goodness for those who love the thought of goodness. Have you ever fallen in love with goodness? That there's something, there's goodness. I'm not, but I see it and I love it. That for those who wish they could be accepted and forgiven. They can and will have that. Christmas is for those who wish and hope and yearn because God came down to bring peace and life. Christmas is a holiday for those who have hope. And it's part of a worldview that you can live, that can make sense, and will help you to be a better person, to live a better life if you will give your heart to the God who loves you and made you. God came down because he's not tired of you. God came down because he didn't want to just erase you or forget you or walk away. Christmas means God cares. Christmas means God cares enough to suffer and to die so that we could have eternal life with him. And this is a worldview that makes sense. And Christmas makes sense. And it's like a flashing neon sign in history. God is real. Brothers and sisters, not only is God real, God really loves you, and God really cares. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, such a beautiful story. Thank you, God, that it's a his, this story is history, that it's true. Thank you, God, that what you did 2,000 years ago resonates so powerfully around the world today that the whole world divides time according to your birth. That the whole world once a year is, is forced to draw its attention back to that baby born in a manger. God in flesh, born to die, born to do something about our hopelessness and our sin, our despair. 
born to bring life. Lord God, we want to be people of hope. Help us, Father, to stand strong in your love. Help us to bring hope and joy and peace and mercy into the lives of everyone around us. Father, we acknowledge our brokenness. We see you, Lord, and we know that you can heal us. Thank you, God. Help us to really celebrate Christmas like we've never celebrated it before. Help us to celebrate Christmas the way you intend us to be, Lord God. Pray all this in your name, God, and thank you again for listening. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.